Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. That's a familiar sound, isn't it? A wonderfully familiar sound, Frank Klopaki's Hell March from Command & Conquer Red Alert. This looks an awful lot like Red Alert, doesn't it? Well, it is, and it isn't. It is, in fact, a brand new engine called OpenRA. I say brand new engine, I mean relative to the age of the games in question. This has actually been in development for years. And this is the current release of it, and it's pretty damn good, and I wanted to show it to you. So, the OpenRA project is an effort to get a, a lot of the old Command & Conquer, just general Westwood games, over to a unified engine with new matchmaking systems and general improvements across the board. So, in this version, they actually have Tiberian Dawn, Red Alert, and Dune 2000. They're currently working on doing Tiberian Sun, which I'm very much looking forward to, and there's even the possibility that we'll actually go all the way up to Red Alert 2 and Yuri's Revenge, which would be pretty fantastic. So, why would you use this version as opposed to the old ones? Well, it's infinitely more compatible than the old ones, so that's something that should be carefully considered. It has a lot of interesting new functionality in terms of the UI that makes it a lot easier, and just something that feels better to a modern audience without actually compromising the gameplay. And in general, it is a more balanced and more feature-rich version of Red Alert. So, let me show a little bit to you. Why not? I'm going to create a game here. I'll also show you the options as well, because there's some interesting things that you might want to make a note of. To the casual observer, a lot of the changes are fairly minor, but if you've actually played the original, you you may notice some fairly nice additions. So, some of the campaign missions are actually in this. This is an open source project, so it's constantly ongoing, and they've added a number of different campaign missions in there, but they also have a lot of other stuff. They actually have 95 maps in the game right now, including 8 campaign maps, 75 conquest maps, and a bunch of mini-games in King of the Hills, which is quite cool. So we've got a conquest here. What should we play on? Something nice and small. Maybe Forest Path. There we go. This is going to be interesting. Alright. I'm going to pick the Soviets, because why on earth would I not pick the Soviets? And... We'll go on normal AI for the time being. We might crank that up a little bit later. I've actually noticed that the Dune 2000 AI is significantly more vicious than the AI, at least on normal, in this interpretation of Red Alert. You also have some options here that you can select. Basic stuff for the most part. And I think that looks good. Let's kick it off. Doesn't take too long to get loaded, so here we go. Alright, well, welcome to Red Alert. It has been a while, hasn't it? So you will notice here that... Immediately, the the actual graphical user interface is a little bit slicker. Yeah? Less nonsense to deal with. Things are put in logical places, in logical order. It's very much a sort of Red Alert 2 style of doing things, where everything's tabbed, as you can see here. They even did this to Dune 2000, which was a really big improvement, actually. And they also changed the order of things, just to put them in logical places that made sense. Everything's, of course, hotkeyed. And it also has an infinite queue system, so you can queue up as many buildings as you want, you can queue up as many units as you want, really doesn't matter all that much at all. Now, if we go to options, and this will actually pause the game, you will notice a couple of other interesting settings. Pixel doubling, for instance. If I do that, it will actually shrink the size of the game here. So this is the game actually running in 1080p, which is obviously far higher a resolution than they ever intended it to run at. So with pixel doubling, it zooms it in a little bit. It's a little bit easier to control. If you want to see a wider view of the battlefield, you can disable that option if you want to be able to control your units a little bit more accurately, or maybe you just don't like the fact that everything's too small, you can select pixel doubling. You've also got a bunch of audio options right there, and interesting input stuff, including bindable hotkeys to a variety of different things. And all this kind of stuff as well. Which is quite nice. Now, they haven't really improved the graphical fidelity of the game, but they have added some useful features, like always show status bars, for instance, which means that you'll always see the health of your units and buildings. Team health colors, which, again, very useful thing to have on there. And in general, they've just made the game easier to play just from an interface standpoint. It doesn't mean it's an easy game. It still plays the way that the old one did, but they have removed some of the annoying little things that got in the way of you actually playing it in the first place. Which, personally, I very much approve of. Alright, I think we'll probably need to grab another more refinery out there. And get some infantry out. 
The general control of your infantry is a little bit easier. The general balance of the infantry seems to be a lot better as well, which I very much approve of. Infantry had a tendency of dying very, very easily, and tank rushing was a, a very good strategy. It's a little bit easier to shut it down this time around, and as you may notice, they've actually added in a couple of extra units, including the Sniper, which is pretty strong. They've also put Attack Move in, which, if you play something like StarCraft 2, yeah, having Attack Move's a pretty big deal, and you certainly want that under all possible circumstances. Alright, there we go, second refinery up. Let's get our radar going. There we go. Now, the funny thing about games like Red Alert is that with these additions, and they, they do seem small, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not saying that they're massive game changers, but with the changes to the user interface, the game actually stands the test of time a hell of a lot better than you might expect. The funny thing about the real-time strategy genre is it hasn't really evolved all that much, which is strange, but it's not a genre that really has had an awful lot done with it. I guess that's because of the focus on console. That would perhaps make the most sense. But it's a little bit disappointing to me as a fan of this particular genre. I'm gonna keep pushing through here, grab the gems. And what that means is that actually, in reality... Is that a pillbox? Yeah, let's stay away from that. There we go. In reality, the game still plays pretty damn well. It's got some weird features, the, the kind of things that you wouldn't expect in a modern RTS, like the ability to just repair stuff, power stuff down, of course, the cell icon. These are sort of relics of a bygone age when it comes to strategy games, but is there really another age other than the bygone age? I mean, think about the two modern examples of strategy games. You've got the Company of Heroes series, and you've got StarCraft II. Yeah? Those are your two really big strategy series outside of the grand strategies. We're talking about real-time strategies in the traditional sense of the word. And StarCraft is very similar to the original StarCraft, as you might imagine. It uses the same kind of building mechanics that the Craft series has used for the longest time. And then you've got Company of Heroes, which kind of goes down its own path and is using mechanics from Dawn of War. And it goes for the whole squad coherency idea, which is something that really only modern RTS does for the most part. I'm going to move this construction yard over here so that I can build another refinery near to these gems. There we go. And all that kind of building as a squad thing was, I wouldn't even say a recent innovation, because it's been many years since that was actually brought into the real-time strategy genre. And it was an interesting one. Uh, it meant that, for the most part, the game switched around from favoring individual unit micromanagement from games like, say, StarCraft and WarCraft 3 to a more general sort of counter and hard counter system. And in the case of stuff like Company of Heroes and e indeed the original Dawn of War also had this, the idea of utilizing cover and the terrain in order to gain an advantage. And I'm not saying that wasn't in things like StarCraft and Warcraft 3. It was the idea of high ground miss, for instance. Yeah. Terrain was clearly something that you had to consider quite carefully. But... It wasn't a massive factor. Eh? It wasn't the biggest factor. It was more a case of build the units you need and then try and micro them as much as possible. Games like Command & Conquer, they were never really too focused on that. It's mostly because of the way that your units actually respond. They have a bit of a delay in terms of their response, as you can see here. And the turn time is quite slow as well, meaning that direct control is a little bit more difficult. You can do it to some degree, and you should be pulling back your injured units and things like that, but... You can't do it to the extent that you can in a game like StarCraft or WarCraft, where the response time was almost instant. This, I think, made Command & Conquer a much easier game for sort of more casual gamers to actually play, and I think it's probably the reason that it was so popular. It was mostly a case of build the right units, do the right kind of maneuvers, and attack in the right places while managing your economy. And managing your economy and just your base in general was an awful lot easier than it is in a game like, say, StarCraft, where you're constantly having to go back to your buildings and keep constructing from each individual one. Of course, in this game, uh, some of you should, I think, hopefully be aware you have a situation where, in fact, you can only build from a single unit construction building, like, say, a barracks or a war factory. And the more that you build, the more that it accelerates that build process. But you have a primary building where the stuff usually spawns. So, build one here, for instance. 
Uh, there's my primary building, and that's where my stuff's going to come from. So I'm going to build 10 grenadiers there, and they're going to spawn from there. And they're going to spawn slightly quicker than they otherwise would. At least they should. Oh, I... Ooh, whoops, I blocked it. <laughs> yeah, don't want that. There we go. It's a little bit easier to manage, frankly. And I think maybe that's why Command & Conquer was so popular. Because you can have very high-level play in it. But it's also quite easy to get into. Uh, building up to get a couple of mammoth tanks and rolling people over, that's not too difficult. That's not massively tricky. Managing your economy is quite simple. It's really a case of getting enough money, your money drains down, things continue to build, you can sell things if you run out of cash. Which you might argue is actually a little bit more difficult than dealing with something like StarCraft 2, where you basically have to pay the full amount in advance of building the unit. So you can uh, very easily think, oh, I'll click the Tesla coil, I'm going to build a Tesla coil. Oh, wait, I don't actually have the money for it. Uh, that could be a problem, but it works surprisingly well, and it keeps the pace of the game up, and you don't necessarily have to worry too much about building everything at the right time. It just kind of keeps building as your money keeps coming in. <coughs> Compare that to a game like StarCraft 2, which is an extremely high skill ceiling, and... I think you can probably see why a game like Command & Conquer would be appealing. And the funny thing is that it's still appealing to this day, because what other options do you have in this genre? You really don't. And that's quite sad. I, I'm very depressed whenever I think about that. I was just like, really? Is, is that really the case that we don't actually have any other better options than this? I'm not, it's not to say that Red Alert's bad, it's just it's ridiculously old. And there just aren't all that many choices for people that like this kind of game anymore. And that makes me sad, because, I mean, how satisfying is this? Just, oh! Massive great hit going on there. How satisfying is it just to incinerate massive groups of troops like that? Got my V2 in position, but they managed to move around with a Ranger, which actually flanked it and took it out, you know? That's a little bit of strategy going on right there. And it's it's really enjoyable. And it still is. It, it really does stand the test of time, you know? surprisingly good way. It's really quite shocking that it does, frankly. I'm going to bring my radar back online. There we go. So this is the kind of thing that I think you can still play and enjoy an awful lot. Which is a little surprising. You wouldn't think that you would be able to in this day and age. It's almost the the case that if you try and do that with, say, a first-person shooter, it's a little bit more difficult to enjoy it. But since this genre has been sort of stuck in time for a while, and some might argue and say, oh, well, you know, it evolved into the Dota genre. It's like, well, it, did it? I mean, was that an evolution or a devolution? To me, that's very much a devolution. It's the idea of saying, right, well, people like to play sort of strategy games, but they don't really want to work for it. So instead of micromanaging a bunch of units and a base and an economy and things like that, and doing the whole 1v1 thing, which is very, very stressful to people, we're just going to make it so you control a single hero that has four abilities. The economy is very, very simple. It's a case of earn money, buy stuff. Uh, there aren't that many choices to be made. And that's where it went, really. Which is funny, because if you look at the evolution of the genre, the way that we thought it was going to go back in the day, and this was sort of as Command & Conquer was starting to peter out a little bit, and then we were seeing games like Ground Control 2 and World in Conflict, was, what we were seeing was, oh, the base building aspect is being removed from strategy games. That's how it's working. Which was an interesting idea, and a lot of us didn't actually like that. Uh, I personally was doubting the idea, I've got to admit. But these days, frankly, I'd kill for a game that did that. Because there's nothing. There's nothing else. How depressing. Oh yeah, if you haven't actually played Red Alert before, you probably owe it to yourself to give it a try. Because it is shocking how well it stands the test of time, really. Oh, could I deploy there? It's still got a few issues, don't get me wrong. Uh, the idea that you have to redeploy your MCV is clunky. Yeah? really, really quite clunky. Unnecessarily so. It doesn't really give you the, the best kind of indicator, but, but at least they added this circle right here, which indicates the area in which you can construct, because you can't build too far away from your construction yard. So thank God for that. Thank God for the little things in that respect. Thank God for infinite queues. Thank God for hotkeys. Good control. 
fully functional bandboxing and control groups. All the kind of things that you really need to enjoy a game like this these days. Ah, now here's the money coming in. That's what I like to see. Alright. I know what you want. Let's get ourselves a mammoth tank. Absolutely. Force our way through here. I'm hoping that there's going to be a bit of a multiplayer scene for this, honestly, because there's a lot of maps, and it seems like the multiplayer works really, really well. It's rock solid, from what I can see. Definitely does the job. And the game runs incredibly well on pretty much everything, so it's hard to complain about that. I haven't noticed any bugs as of yet, although there's been some really odd design decisions in some of them. If you're looking for a complete clone of Red Alert, you'll probably be a bit disappointed because they messed around with things. They added new units in and things like that. And even in Dune 2000, I was reading up because I was trying to remember, hang on a second, in Dune 2000, was building concrete slabs a thing because it wasn't Dune 2. Turns out, yeah, it was in Dune 2000, but they can't implement it in this engine. Now, they're trying to figure out how to do it, but they can't because of some limitation that involves building one building on another crashing the engine. So there's definitely limitations to it. You know, it's not all flowers and sunshine and roses and wonderful things, but there's a decent amount of wonderful things to be enjoyed in a game like this. Ooh, the demo truck. That might be ideal for blowing my hole through here if we can actually make the money. I think I might need to build another MCV. I can do that, right? Yeah, it's 2000 to do that. Expensive. Construction complete. Service depot is done, so we can actually build a mammoth tank, but we're running rapidly out of resources, so... At least something to consider there. There we go. And I think we can sell this off as well. What I'd like to see is a limitation on the number of unit barks that are going on. Because that does get a little silly, honestly. The fact that you get building, building, on hold, on hold, and all those kind of looping, overlapping sound effects is, is a little daft, you know. It's, it seems like it was a limitation of the time, and it's something they could definitely fix. There's certainly room for improvement in aspects of it, don't get me wrong. Wow, I powered down off a silo, that's embarrassing. Oh dear. And I think the AI for Red Alert in particular maybe needs to be made a bit more aggressive. Maybe it's just because I'm on normal AI and that's not good enough. But the AI in Dune 2000 is brutal. So it, it surprised me greatly that it's, they're barely trying to attack me here. But that's fine. It gives me enough time to build a mammoth tank. Run them down with it. Or a demo truck. I'd really love to throw a demo truck in there. That would be hilarious. Alright, I think we're going to sell off this refinery. And we can build another refinery closer over here. Building. That should do the job. I want to go and scout in this direction, see if there's anywhere else we can mine. Should be able to. Silos apparently needed. That's fine. We can spend them on more Tesla coils or some such. There we go. There's a mammoth tank. That's what I'm talking about. The music, though. The music actually doesn't come with this game. You've got to find it. I did manage to find a .mix file, which actually has all the music in it, that does work with this version. As much as it would be nice to just import MP3s, it doesn't seem like you can do that. You've got to put them in some really weird archived file format. But I did find a lot of really nice music from the original games that were put into mix files, so... I will link that for you so that you can use it. I didn't manage to find the Dune 2000 music doing that, though, which is a little disappointing. But when I show you a little bit of Dune 2000, I will actually mix the music in in post. Because I actually have the soundtrack by Frank Lepaki, which is as cool as you might expect. There we go. Alright, do I have my mammoth tank? Yes! Is it too big to fit through the gap? Absolutely! <laughs> this could take a while. I was going to head around in that direction. Alright, there we go. Fair enough. We've got another refinery down there. To deal with some of the clogging we have going on. Very nice. And we can maybe get a couple more V2s out there. And actually attack that position. I would think should be enough to deal with most of it, but... It's not even just nostalgia, I think, when it comes to a game like this. It's just... Red Alert was just good. Like, Command & Conquer in general was just very, very good at what it did, and it made some very important advancements when it came to RTS in terms of making things work better and improvements to UI and unit control. And those are hugely important. Massively so. Blizzard did a lot for it as well, but they did it in a particular way, and Westwood had its own ideas about how that kind of thing should work. There we go. Nice big fight going on. 
My mammoth tank should be able to kill that, but I will lose all my infantry, which is maybe not so ideal. Mammoth tanks do not care about machine guns. There we go. Speaking of not caring about infantry... Yeah, run him down. There we go. I'm actually going to lose here. He's been building up for the longest time, and now he's absolutely decimating me. That's not good. Well, maybe my concerns about the AI were unfounded. That is a possibility here. <laughs> Some flamethrower troops out pretty quickly. Might be able to deal with these guys. Oh, that V2. Man. Yeah, I actually hope they do put Red Alert 2 into this, because the V3 rockets in that and the Dreadnoughts were just fantastic. There we go. Let's pop down a flame turret. That should make things a little bit interesting. Lost a refinery, which is not ideal, but not too shabby. I really need to learn the hotkeys as well, but that's something I would eventually figure out, no doubt. There we go. I also added in some nice little effects, as you can see here, like burning wrecks, which are very, very cool. I have a lot of money now, don't I? Huge amounts of it. I probably should just blow them up. <laughs> Mad tanks. Mammoth tanks. That's what we like to see. Rebuild my Tesla coil at the front. It's still a good game. Shockingly. We talk about games that stand the test of time, you don't think about real-time strategy too much. I guess because it just, you know, it really does look extremely basic, but you've got to consider how, how fancy does it really have to look in order to actually be any good. And the answer is not very. It still does the job very, very well. I think we need to get a few more airfields and defenses down. There we go. Get the Tesla coil out over there. Get down a couple of flame towers. Build some more dudes. Shock troopers, snipers. I have so much money to spend. I'm going to go as long as driving a demolition truck into the middle of their army, and then I think that'll probably be about it. And I'll show you a little bit of Dune 2000 after that. Alright, here we go. This should be fun. Move the army forward. Move the demo truck around. I go right into the defensive line with it. At least that's the plan anyway. <laughs> oh man. Demo trucks were always fun. I can't remember. Were they in, I think they were one of the expansions if I recall correctly, but they're a rather hilarious unit. And I think we've actually broken them now, so there we go. Ah, sweet. Alright, let's have a quick look at Dune 2000 just for the sake of it. That was his base. Rather small and compact. Okay. So let's have a look at Dune 2000 and their interpretation of that. Dune 2000 did not get a good reception when it first came out in the 90s. And kind of rightfully so, because it took the classic Dune 2, which was, of course, as you might imagine, the place where most modern RTS came from, one of Westwood's earlier efforts. And it didn't really do much with it. It made some changes to the interface, which were actually sorely needed, because Dune 2's interface is woefully out of date. You, you want an example of something that doesn't stand the test of time? The original Dune 2. Yeah, that does not stand the test of time at all, and the reason is the interface was awful. Like, right, context-sensitive right-clicking, bandboxing, things like that, none of those existed. So you, were, you had a lot of problems as a direct result. Alright, we will get... Now, these bots are absolutely vicious, so I thoroughly expect to lose here. We'll take the Ordos. There we go. And Tuxiach will be the map. Alright, here we go. Dune 2000. And can we... Do we want to go here? I want to go a bit closer to the spice, I think. There we go. Alright. So you'll notice that the interface looks quite similar to Red Alert, and kind of rightfully so. The original interface did not have any of these tabs here, so Dune 2000 was a bit of a pain in that respect. But they also removed some functionality, which quite surprised me. They removed, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the video, the notion of placing down concrete slabs, which was a thing from Dune 2. If you didn't build stuff on concrete slabs, it gradually lost health. 
and that wasn't too good. And they could also be used to speed up your units, kind of like creep in StarCraft 2. That's not in this port because the engine apparently can't handle it. So that's something that they're continuing to work through. Bit of a shame because I thought that was one of the nice little defining features of the Dune series that they they took that construction and they put a little extra layer on top of it that things like Command and Conquer didn't have. But complete. the spice, oh yes, the spice is still there. I was hoping to be able to construct here, but it looks like I, I made a horrible mistake in terms of my construction. I guess I could rebuild, but I can't really afford to because the AI is going to try and murder me, murder me very, very quickly. The idea of mining spice, for instance, very much still here. You can actually spawn more spice from spice blooms. I don't know if they've got worms in. I haven't seen sandworms if they have them. It would, of course, be very disappointing if they haven't managed to implement those, because the idea of sandworms was a very interesting one. These sandworms would actually roam the map underneath the resource, and they would occasionally swallow up your harvesters. You had to be very aware of the map as a result, and if you heard about a worm sign, you need to move out of the way. You could also use units like thumpers to actually attract worms to enemy structures, and for the most part, units that decided to venture onto the sand. It was a cool idea. Very cool idea indeed. Get a factory up on a few more of these units. Unit Going ready. straight for a heavy factory to get myself Unit some ready. units there. There's also the light factory as well. For the most part, Unit Dune ready. didn't really go for the whole build all of your Unit land ready. units from one structure thing. They had the light factory, the heavy factory, and also the starport. Now, the starport has not really been, been implemented in the same way as it was in Dune. Now, in Dune 2 and Dune 2000, I think even in Emperor as well, they made the starport specifically so that you could actually order in units in bulk. You had to pay a lot of extra money to do it, so it could certainly hurt you. But you were able to order in a bunch of units at a time for a premium, and they'd all land at once in one shipment. In this, though, it's basically just another factory that delivers a unit once every so many seconds if you buy it. Which, uh, I, I'm not massively keen on, I'm gonna be totally frank here. It would be a, nice if they'd gone for the original approach, because I thought that was a really nice way of doing it. It's a nice bit of balance. Uh, you could order in the shipment and you get everything at once, but you had to wait a while to get it. So you had to be careful about when you did it. And it, co it cost a premium. So if you wanted to mass order units, you could do that. But you couldn't order faction-specific units either. The three factions in Dune had a lot of overlapping units. Whereas in, say, Red Alert, they only had two factions. They tried to make a bit of an effort to diversify them. In Red Alert 2, they diversified them very heavily. In Dune, now they overlapped stuff like combat tanks, and pretty much everyone has riflemen and troopers. They were all available, but there's stuff like the Sardaukar, which are a faction-specific unit, the Devastator, which is a faction-specific unit, things like that. And in this version of it, they've actually differentiated the battle tanks. The Harkonnen one has more health, the Ordos one has more speed, the Atreides one has more range. So, they've made some efforts there. And Dune always felt like it was taking... I wouldn't even... It wasn't even second fiddle. It was like third fiddle to Command and Conquer and Red Alert. Which was unfortunate. Because I, I love the original Dune 2. It's what got me into RTS. It was one of the... It was the first strategy game I ever played. And it was an absolutely wonderful experience. Even if it's completely dated these days. Dune 2000 might have been a bit of a disappointment. But... From an art direction standpoint, I actually much preferred it to games like Red Alert because it just looks better. Everything from the unit portraits here to the actual design of the harvesters and things like that that have, of course, inspiration from the Dune film as well. It all just made the game look a little bit more unique than Command & Conquer and Red Alert did, and I appreciated that an awful lot. Now, as I was saying, this is not an easy AI at all. I think I'm actually just going to straight up lose here. I don't know, maybe I've got enough trikes, so I should probably reinforce with a few more. Trikes are pretty good at taking out those basic infantry, but... These guys will hit you, and they will hit you hard. There we go, I managed to get the clean up there, so that's not too shabby. Could probably use a, another spice refinery as well. Get things a little bit quicker. But yeah, that's June 2000 interpreted in the open RA engine, which is also pretty good. And if I, I would love to actually find the music somewhere, I'm sure, yeah, I'm not sure someone's done a mixed file, but they might have. So maybe I can find that somewhere. I also forgot to actually build an outpost, so I have no radar. It's like, hold on a minute, I'm pretty sure this had a mini-map. Well, there you go. Well, it's free, folks, which means it's pretty much worthy of your time. Most things that are free are, well, not everything, but in this case, very much so. 
It's a very effective port. Uh, they've certainly taken some liberties with it at times, which... Uh, half of me says I'm not okay with them kind of besmirching the original, but the other half of me says actually the original had its own problems, so... You know, and that's something that we should accept. It is a classic, but that doesn't mean there wasn't room for improvement. And there very, very much was. The addition of the multiplayer and the obvious, like, ease of getting multiplayer games now is a huge factor, in my honest opinion, and something that I think you should dearly, dearly consider. It is an RTS classic, and this interpretation is rock solid. Very, very nice indeed. So give it a download. It's in the description below this video. It is all completely free. You do, in fact, you don't even have to download anything like a, a set of data for each of the games. It is free. Straight up free. You download it, you play. It's as simple as that. It takes very, very little time indeed. And as a result, it's something that you should strongly consider. The guys who actually dealt with this did a pretty fantastic job, I've got to say. I've been very, very impressed with what they've managed to do with these older RTS titles. And it's still playable to this day. It's still a hell of a lot of fun. My name has been Total Biscuit, taking a look at Open RA, the interpretations of Command and Conquer Red Alert, and Dune 2000. I'll see you next time.